Next on Worcester News tonight, boxing returns to Worcester. We'll take you inside the ring and meet the area's oldest professional boxer. Plus, a local man speaking out on the dangers of opioid addiction. We'll hear more from his personal story. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Catherine Indrioli. We begin with a two alarm fire damaging a home in West Boylston this evening. The fire broke out inside a single family home on Colonial Hill Drive. Fire fi firefighters say the fire was contained, but it did cause severe damage to the interior and exterior of the home. There were no injuries reported. The cause of the fire is still under investigation. Boxing returned to Worcester tonight, and so did one of the area's oldest professional boxers, who fought his retiring fight tonight at age 49. Chuck Schoen says he trained for several months to prepare for his professional boxing match in five and a half years. Schoen is the second oldest boxer to fight professionally in Massachusetts. Hundreds of people came out to watch the match. Legendary boxer and Worcester native Jose Rivera helped promote the event. He says it's great to bring boxing back into the Worcester community. I mean, you know, but boxing has always been, you know, this city has always uh, been a boxing city. And also it uh, it's, uh, goes back to the community because we're able to work with a charity organization like YME so we can get back to a charity organization. So it's almost like uh, working with the city, you know, giving back to the city type of thing. Family has a, a, a history in boxing. It's uh, started off as a hobby that just kind of got a little out of control on me. And next thing you know, I'm 49 years old and here I am fighting. Just get ready mentally, just make sure I'm going to follow the game plan that we did in training and just make sure I envision what's going to happen in the fight and then make it happen. And tonight was the first professional boxing match in the city since Edwin Rod Rodriguez won at Mechanics Hall in August 2011. We'll have highlights from the fight coming up in sports. A local man is speaking out on the opioid crisis after he says he battled with addiction for nearly 15 years. Cam Jandro spoke with the man today who shared his story with addiction. Frank Huntley stands on a street corner in Worcester with a unique friend by his side. Hopefully this changes your mind. Do not let something like this control you. Enjoy your life. Pillman is Huntley's way of fighting the opioid crisis. Huntley was prescribed Oxycontin and methadone after dislocating his arm and his battle with addiction began at that moment. He says after 15 years of substance abuse, he couldn't take it anymore. And it took me 15 years to wake up, but now I want to show people how this can really get out of hand. And it is getting out of hand. We're losing way too many people. We're losing family members. We're losing friends. The statue is composed of every pill bottle Huntley was prescribed after his injury. He says the time to talk about opioids is over, and it's time to show people what drugs can do to you. So I'm here to show people reality, okay? I'm here to show them that one pill, okay? That one pill turned into 420 a month, okay? That's what I'm trying to show them, that reality of that control, okay? It doesn't matter what it is, it takes control. Huntley says he's going to take Pillman all across the city and even stand in front of some pharmacies to make the message about opioid addiction that much stronger. He says changing the life of one person who suffers with substance abuse is more than enough to make his efforts worthwhile, but he aims to help as many lives as he possibly can. Catherine? Thank you, Cam. The Worcester Armory theft suspect who escaped from a Rhode Island prison pleaded not guilty today in federal court. James Morales was arraigned on several charges. He sparked a nearly week-long multi-state manhunt earlier this month. He was arrested in Somerville after allegedly trying to rob two banks. Morales was originally in prison for stealing guns from the Worcester Armory back in 2015. The Blackstone man, who is a person of interest in his father's murder, is fighting his rendition to Massachusetts. 83-year-old Walter Armstrong was found dead inside his Blackstone, ho Blackstone home earlier this month. Glenn Armstrong was arrested in New Jersey and remains in jail there on $300,000 bail. During his arraignment, Armstrong told the court he would not voluntarily return to Massachusetts. The Worcester County District Attorney's Office is preparing a governor's warrant requisition application to try and bring back Armstrong. 
Pamela Morris found an abandoned baby in a Worcester parking lot back in 2000. The case of Baby May inspired the safe haven law in Massachusetts, which allows a woman to safely give up a newborn at a local fire or police station. And years later, Morris is hoping to meet Baby May. Our Roslyn Flaherty has the story. Almost 17 years later, Pamela Morris stands in the exact spot where she found Baby May. Now she's hoping to meet her. It feels great. All the memories are coming back. In May of 2000, Morris discovered a supermarket shopping bag sitting next to her car in this Vernon Hill parking lot. She soon discovered a baby inside. Look inside and all I saw was a baby's head. And I think it had a little blood on it. It was wrapped in a towel, a white towel with blood all over it. Doctors determined the baby girl was born within only a few hours before Morris found her. Four years later, the Massachusetts Baby Safe Haven Law passed because of Baby May. Allows a woman to surrender her baby up to seven days old to a staffed worker at a fire station, a police station, or a hospital with no questions asked and no prosecution. Moore says she never got to hold Baby May and today is hoping to connect with her and her family. Be a void in my life that I feel because I always wondered about her. You know, if she was wondering what happened to her, if she knows she's adopted and that I saved her life. Moore says she has once received a picture of baby May from the state. She says the picture sits in her living room, but she has lost all contact with her connection to baby May. I guess I wanted this earlier, like before she grew up. I wanted to find out where she is and I hope this will do it. I hope she sees this and comes forward and wants to meet me. Rosalind Flaherty, Worcester News Tonight. Mechanics Hall will be holding a viewing party for Donald Trump's inauguration tomorrow. Friday, excuse me, doors will open at 11 and it is free to the public. This is the second inauguration party at Mechanics Hall. The first was eight years ago for President Obama. Executive Director Bob Kennedy says President Obama's inauguration made history and he believes President-elect Donald Trump's will too. It's a testament to the fact that the democracy, the democratic form of government we have chosen survives. This last election season was one that was filled with a lot of controversy. The final results were very close, but democracy survives. And Kennedy says eight years ago, more than 500 people watched the inauguration at Mechanics Hall. He is hoping the community will come together this year and do the same. President-elect Donald Trump is re already taking part in inaugural activities. Friday, he will take the oath of office and become the nation's 45th president. Protests are planned here in Worcester, including one encouraging students to leave their classes in the middle of the school day. Administrators are threatening penalties for the students' walkout. Our Olivia Lemon has the story. Everett O'Laire is a senior at Doherty High School. He's also a representative of the Worcester Socialist Alternative Group. Friday, he and the group plan on participating in a walkout to protest President-elect Donald Trump's inauguration. Protests, historically speaking, uh, protests have gotten us the civil rights and the workers' rights that we want. Olaire says he knows of a couple hundred students across the city who plan on participating in the walkout. He says students plan on leaving school around 1215 and meeting at City Hall around 1245 to peacefully protest. If there's a momentum where a bunch of kids can just rush out and say, hey, we're walk out, go to your lockers, get your stuff, you know, we're going to march downtown. I feel like a lot of kids are going to be like, oh, man, I got to do this. Like, I really have to stand up for this. And they'll walk out, too. Worcester Public School Superintendent Maureen Benenda says she got word of the walkout after seeing brochures distributed to students. Benenda says a walkout would be a violation of school rules and students will face a penalty. That I cannot support and would never support students leaving school without parent permission. Benenda says if this is the student's first offense, they will have to serve detention. She says schools will be offering peaceful dialogues tomorrow for students. In some schools, for example, tomorrow uh, students will assemble in the auditorium. They actually will watch the inauguration of the president and have that discussion with their teachers. You know, I certainly agree with her. This is not the venue for, parent, for uh, children and students to walk out and uh, protest. Meanwhile, Olaire says he will protest regardless of the penalty and is looking forward to the outcome. I might get suspended. I don't care. I'm fighting for what I believe in. Olivia Lemon, Worcester News Tonight. 
This week, the Worcester Railers were officially added as an expansion team to the East Coast Hockey League, allowing them to officially take part in the 2017-2018 season. Our Andy Madison has more on what's next for the Railers. The banner serves as an unofficial countdown outside the DCU Center. Inside the DCU Center, it's the date everyone in the Railers organization is focused on. We're looking at the light at the end of the tunnel, and that's October 14th. So now it's literally the finishing stretch for us. Railers president Michael Myers has returned from the ECHL All-Star Game in upstate New York, where the team was unanimously approved by the Board of Governors for the upcoming season. It's the last official hurdle for professional hockey's return to the city. Really? It's cheap. He was. We're all systems go, so everybody's been on board since we, we didn't hire anybody uh, with the assumption that we weren't uh, getting in the league. The team has a coach, a place to play their home games, and more than 1,100 members in the Railers Hockey Club. It's exciting that uh, a new thing's starting. Um, with anything new, there's probably going to be some transition, but hopefully um, it can turn out to be what I remember Ice Cats being, you know, back in the 90s. I'm super pumped for the Railers to come. I think it's great for the city. I think it's going to add a lot of you know, economic vitality potentially to the city. Excitement shared by many downtown businesses craving to have hockey back in the city and bringing more people to downtown Worcester. We're excited, you know. Um, it's nice to have a team back over there. We definitely noticed when there wasn't. Um, it's a hockey city, so we're excited to have them back. Meyer says the next order of business is closing in on a team affiliation and then adding more members to the team, both on the ice and in their front office. So many different things coming down the pike that uh, to be excited about that um, it's not hard to stay relevant in the forefront and, uh, and excited all the way through to October. Andy Madison, Worcester News.